Hello and welcome to Global Eye. I'm Parikshit Lutra. World leaders have gathered in Japan's Hiroshima for the G7 summit, which kicks off today. The Russia-Ukraine war, US-China tensions and international trade will take center stage at the G7 high table. The day began on a somber note as Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, US President Joe Biden and other G7 leaders laid wreaths to honor the victims of US atomic bombing in 1945. The G7 have once again called on Russia to end the war in Ukraine. They have agreed on imposing new sanctions on Moscow to starve them of technology, industrial equipment and services that fuels Russia's war machinery. While Ukraine President Zelensky is set to attend the summit in person, as for the Quad Leader Summit, it will now be taking place in Hiroshima instead of Australia. And the next one will be held in India. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi also arrived in Hiroshima. India is among the invitees to the summit. In an interview to Japanese news portal Nikkei, the Prime Minister said he wanted to amplify the voices and concerns of the Global South. I spoke with uh, Patsy Vida Guswara, White House Bureau Chief for Voice of America earlier today. And I began by asking her about the agenda and uh, broad focus of the G7 meeting. So the broad focus of the G7 here in Hiroshima, Japan, has really been the two countries that are not part of the G7, that is China and Russia. So the seven wealthy democracies that are convening here in Hiroshima are essentially looking at two things. Number one, how to push back against Russian aggression in Ukraine, how to support Ukraine in terms of uh, applying more sanctions on Russia, uh, creating a situation where there are less likelihood of evasions of those sanctions. And number two, how to make China follow the rules of the road in terms of international trade, combating what this group calls China's, in, uh, China's economic coercion practices. So those two major themes are really just the thing that sh overshadows everything, even though the host, the Japanese uh, government of Prime Minister Kishida, has already also reached out to the global south that's why he is inviting countries that are not members of the g7 including mm -hmm. india indonesia vietnam comoros and so on to be part of this discussion in part to link together the agenda of the g7 towards the upcoming agenda of the g20 which of course will be hosted by india so those two big themes as well as including the global south is the Major, uh, is the dominant theme of this G7 here at the Hiroshima in Japan. Uh, Patsy, when it comes to sanctions, uh, what have we seen so far with, with countries stepping up sanctions against Russia? Yeah, so the G7 countries came out with a pretty strong statement on Ukraine. You know, this is on the first day of the summit. They came out saying that we support all efforts to defend uh, Ukraine to reach what they called a just and long-lasting peace, which means that Russia has to withdraw all its troops from occupied territories. And so the leaders also came out with their own packages of sanctions. The U.S. came out with something like, you know, sanctions fresh new sanctions on at least 300 entities. The UK came out with sanctions on diamonds, on copper, on aluminum, and other industries. So the focus really is on the enforcement of existing sanctions, as well as broadening those sanctions to new sectors and new industries. And as far as support for Ukraine, of course, the big news coming out of this G7 is uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine, who made the visit to Hiroshima in order to rally support for his country. This is, again, something that the G7 leaders have been really strong in terms of supporting, as well as the um, invitees that are non-G7 countries. So in terms of Russia, there's a clear uh, message coming out of the G7 countries that they reject uh, the kind of behavior that has come out of Russia. They reject the kind of a uh, nuclear threat that Russia has been uh, using in terms of deploying nuclear, tactical nu nuclear weapons in Belarus, for example. So these are all very, very strong statements coming out of the leaders. Patsy Bidogoswara, thank you so much for joining us here on Global Eye. To take this forward, we're now joined by Aaron Murphy, Deputy Director and Senior Fellow for Economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. Give us a sense of the economic priorities of President Joe Biden as... Uh, he meets leaders at the G7 meeting in Hiroshima. There are several priorities um, that Joe Biden, I think, will pursue at the G7 summit. Uh, the one, and it's been mentioned earlier in the show, is how to decouple from China or at least um, diversify supply chains in other sectors, uh, especially when it comes to critical minerals, semiconductors, and how the G7 partners can work together to either friend shore 
uh, find ways to support each industry um, in their countries to help diversify that supply chain, whether it's in critical minerals, especially when you're looking at electric vehicles or semiconductor chips. Another one is how do you support the global South? Having India there, Vietnam, Indonesia, I think is an important indicator that the US, but also G7 partners are looking to support the global South um, to be strategically competitive with China, offering an alternative to the Belt and Road and other areas in infrastructure and development. Two years ago, uh, the G7 partners announced a major infrastructure initiative, and last year they named it the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, which was looking to produce a $600 billion fund to support high quality standards filled infrastructure throughout the global south in Latin America, Africa, and in the Indo Pacific. But $600 billion is not going to be enough to address the trillions of dollars of, of uh, the infrastructure gap, but it's a start. Right, Erin, uh, the United States clearly wants to poke China's economic version on, uh, on the table, fair and square, at the G7. How much support does the United States really have? Uh, and are the policies which the US is using till now to uh, counter China economically are they really succeeding on the ground? Well, I think that's a great question because this is certainly easier said than done. I think one thing to note is the change in tone on Chinese economic coercion, but also how to work with China. You can't destroy the world's second largest economy. That's a billion dollar or a billion person economy. You don't want to hurt the actual Chinese people themselves. So you've seen a bit of a step back in the rhetoric where Secretary Yellen, even a few weeks ago in her speech, had said, we don't look to destroy the economy or hurt the Chinese people. And I think that message has been reiterated in the G7. That said, conversely, what the G7 partners are saying is that they're not willing to tolerate Chinese economic coercion um, against smaller countries. We've seen them do this to Australia, Lithuania, um, and, and the Philippines. And you know, looking forward to seeing where China has a stronghold and a lot of critical industries, especially when it comes to semiconductors, um, solar supply chain. Uh, you know, I think that the G7 is looking for a way to do this. Um, you know, a lot of words, a lot of speeches, a lot of announcements have been said, but, you know, whether or not uh, this will come to pass, I think, is a, is another question. Again, it's easier to say this than do this. And I think that right. as the G7 countries look to unwind or decouple or find alternative ways to produce, say, semiconductors, it's, they're going to figure out how intertwined they are with China, but also that you can't create a domestic industry from scratch. For example, a semiconductor fabrication facility costs right. about $20 billion to make. Is that really worth the investment? Um, in terms of whether or not the U.S. has support among the G7 countries, I think it varies in level of support. I think that the U.S. can rely on India and Japan in terms of its um, considerations of China and how they view economic coercion is definitely uh, a national security concern for all three of those countries. Okay. For the Europeans, it's been a bit more of a, a mixed bag. Um, we've seen Macron, the French leader, sort of warm up a little bit more to China. And then there's been questions over how strong Germany's support is for the United States efforts to combat China. Um, so I think, you know, we'll it will remain to be seen, especially as they start pursuing these policies of diversifying away from China and seeing how difficult that could be. Okay, uh, just to ask you on the Quad, the Quad Summit, uh, which is supposed to take place in uh, Australia, had been cancelled earlier. And in fact, the, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia went on record to do so because President Biden was not coming. Now, the leaders mm -hmm. have decided to do it in Hiroshima itself. What kind of a message does this send out? regarding the urgency connected with this meeting? I think rescheduling the Quad and having them meet in Hiroshima is a strong signal that the leaders are committed to this cooperation, to this collaboration. Um, in the last two years, the Quad has certainly stepped up in its engagement. What was once an informal 
partnership to address critical issues, whether it's relief efforts at the two, after the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. Now you're seeing kind of a proliferation of in areas where they are cooperating, whether it's healthcare, especially with COVID-19 support, um, semiconductors, critical technologies, education, maritime security awareness, space. I mean, it's really proliferated in terms of interest. So I think having the leaders meet, it's not going to be a lot of substance in a leader's meeting, but what it does show is strong optics that this partnership will continue, that it is strong, that it is a priority for all four leaders um, of the Quad countries. Right. Uh, do you expect the G7, G7 leaders in their bilateral meeting with Prime Minister Modi to put pressure to decouple from Russia? India has maintained an independent relationship with Russia. We have always maintained that war should come to an end. We have to give diplomacy a chance. Negotiations must bring the war to an end. But at the same time, we continue buying oil from Russia. Our trade relationship continues. Our independent relationship with Russia continues on its own. Uh, do you get a sense there will be pressure in India to decouple? I certainly think so. I mean, the Russia-Ukraine war has been a significant topic for the G7. In fact, one of the top topics of the G7 discussion, um, the announcement of sanctions, increased pressure on Russia to stop its attacks on Ukraine. And I think certainly Prime Minister Modi will feel the pressure from the G7 to take some action in curbing its economic relationship with Russia. I mean, understanding that India has its own policies. It's been helpful on China, and I think that that's been welcome. But on Russia, I think it's been a bit of a disappointment. So I do expect that Prime Minister Modi will get um, some strong pressure from all of the members of the G7 to do something on Russia. All right. Erin Murphy, it was a pleasure having you here on Global Eye talking about uh, President Biden's priorities at the G7 and what the G7 would like to convey to India as well on the Ukraine war. Uh, thanks once again for being with us here on CNBC TV 18. Moving on to the